This is Peter. And this is Tom. And you're listening to History Teachers Talking Podcasts. All right, this is Peter Zablocki and Thomas Reska, and welcome back to our podcast. Tommy, this is going to be a pretty short one, I think. Uh, just yeah, we always say that, and it winds up being 40 minutes, so we'll see. <laughs> I don't know about this one. I don't know. All right, so what, uh, what do we got today, Tom? Well, the keep uh, in the festive spirit of the holidays, we're going to be looking at the 1914 Christmas Truce, a series of, un, of widespread unofficial ceasefires along the Western Front during the First World War. So people have heard about it. There's these lot of like issues about it. Um, movies have been made happen, about this. Movies have made about songs. it. Like songs. Yeah, like yeah. Snoopy vs. Red Barons kind of. There's been other ones too, obviously. Yeah. So it's something that people talk about. I know we've talked. To, I've talked about it in my classes in the past. I'm sure you yeah, have same too. Here. Yeah. And I, you know, doing more, you do more of a deep dive into it today. Kind of look at it. Was it as big of a deal as people say it is? And that's kind of what you and I talked about before we click record. Is the fact that it really isn't as big of a deal as people make it out to be because it's it makes for an awesome movie. It's a nice fairy tale. It was Here's more commonplace, more... I guess, early on than what yep. people realize. You're right. It's something that's happened early on, and then it was very quickly like, yeah, let's not do that again. Well, it wasn't. Once to, well, we'll get to it, but let, yeah. let's backtrack and kind right, of just so look a little World bit. World War One, um, right? We're talking World War One in general, right? Yep, so, yeah, the context. Go so ahead. <laughs> we'll talk about World War One. We'll talk about the trenches, uh, trench warfare, and a little bit of as to how the soldiers get here. And we'll discuss also why this Christmas truce, where you had enemies on both sides come out of the trenches and as opposed to kill one another on Christmas Eve, they're like, hey, why don't we like you know, you know, change some stories and play some soccer or football. But um, but before we get there, so just contextually, this is World War One, also known as the Great War, right? Largest conflict in history up to that point. Um, and at the time, so the French mobilized almost like 8.5 million men and the British nearly 9 million men. Uh, the Russians had 12 million, the Germans 11 million. Yeah, massive, massive, massive. These are numbers I mean, that that people really didn't you didn't see before this and this is a this is a modern war but it's um obviously you know if you a uh, student of history it's a modern war but with not so modern tactics and that's one reason why you have the the trench warfare comes out of this and the, yeah. the, the, the amount of deaths that happen or because 25 of million this, uh, it says 20 more than 25 yeah. killed and wounded more than 25 million men um and most and of them because in a the, horrible way yeah yeah absolutely. well it's because the tactics are napoleonic era while they're fighting with weapons that are modern. Machine yep. guns and Napoleonic era tactics don't work out very well. Indeed. So just kind of briefly on how we get to this whole trench warfare, and then Tom and I will talk a little bit about what was trench warfare, but it's, trench warfare really starts um, when the German decide that they're going to go through Belgium to attack France, right? So they're going through Belgium into Paris, um, the Schlieffen plan, I believe that's, that was the name of it. Yeah, knock, knock them out of the war quickly so they can focus on, on you know. Russia. Yep. So the Belgians uh, raised more than the German generals had expected. So it, it slowed them down more or less. And the Schlieffen plan failed for several reasons. One, Russia, as you mentioned just now, mobilized more quickly than expected, which kind of brought them into war quicker. Um, and therefore, Germans had to shift their soldiers to the east. So that weakened them in the west. And they got fairly close to Paris. But you know, no cigars, they say. The first battle of the Marne ended Germany's hopes for any form of quick victory in the Western Front. And this sets us up because basically here you have the British and the French are defending France. Um, after this first battle of the Marne, Germany realizes that half of their troops have to be sent over to fight Russia. They're kind of stuck here, too, but they don't want to give ground and give up what they already managed to get through the Schlieffen plan. So they start digging into these trenches to protect their armies from any form of enemy fire, right? Which leads to more or less a, a stalemate. You know, in 1914, this is within months of war starting. It's already a stalemate. Now, these um, trenches that we, we talk about basically stretched from the Swiss frontier all the way to the English Channel. Uh, there was an underground network that linked bunkers, um, communication trenches, gun emplacements. This was a very elaborate system. Um, during these trenches... Yeah, and and some, of, some of them were much fancier than others. German, a lot of them actually, were just... Yeah, right. the Germans... Were, well, because the Germans' plan was like, we're just going to stay here, that's it. They yeah. decided pretty early on, we're just doing defensively. Um, we're going to say nice. They're nice by what the British standards were. Yes. The British standards, they always assume, no, we're just going to keep on attacking and moving forward. 
And so these trenches were never built to be lasting a long time. That's why you're up like your knee in water. You know, you have the, you're hunched over a lot of times. You know, bigger ones were a bit more elaborate as time went on when they realized they were going to be there a little longer. But yeah. you didn't want to be here. You're basically exposed. You're basically digging a hole in the ground. That's where you're hanging out. Literally. They got a machine gun, they got yep. a machine gun fire. Rats, uh, lice, uh, mud. Yeah, it, it was it was just downright disgusting. And between these opposing trenches, which is kind of all this sets a kind of sets us up here. Between all these opposing trenches lay what became known as no man's land. It was an empty tract, mostly pocketed with shell holes. Right, you, you often see that in movies. Um, and you had you know coils of barbed wire <laughs> on each side. The soldiers kind of peered over the edge of their trenches and kind of watched the next enemy attack from the trench that was across this no man's land and then uh, eventually obviously they would hear a whistle and they would themselves have to charge across this man-made the desert yeah, over the top and which is crazy because when you hear that whistle it's like no protection by your rifle and helmets and you're just charging against you know across no man's land towards enemy lines your only form of safety is jumping into these huge craters left over from artillery and you're being fired at by machine guns that are shooting like 600 bullets per like minute or second i mean this is Obviously, that's a discrepancy between minute or second, but you, you get my point. <laughs> it was brutal, and that's one reason why the Germans in World War II create Blitzkrieg, right? Is they want to avoid, they want yeah. to avoid having another round of trench warfare. Both sides do. They don't want to go back to trench warfare again. That's why they come up with new tactics, and that's a whole other podcast, obviously. But just to keep in mind, like the main reason of a lot of those strategies that you see in the Second World War is to avoid the trench warfare of the First World War, because neither side wanted to have it. Yep. So this is trench warfare at the time of what we're going to be talking about today is fairly new. I mean, they really start digging into the trenches after the Battle of Marne. So we're looking at September 1914. And what we're talking about here is happening December 24th to 25th of 1914. So yeah, was, trench it, warfare is still new. Yeah, it was only the first five months after hostilities began. And early on, there wasn't as much. So there was fighting, but it was still very early on. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they think this happened. Um, before this, like we said, they used to still mingle a little bit. They'd have um, burial ceremonies. They'd have prisoner swamps. They still did that. Let's talk about it. It was kind of this um, thing that's known as live and let live. They kind of like both sides of these like unofficial truce would allow once in a while during this time. You would, you would have some fraternization. You'd have some talking with one another. Um, to but just it was mostly to get into no man's land and get bodies, right? And, and get the dead, and the yeah. wounded, if anyone would happen to still be alive. Um, but it was most, that's really what all it really was. It wasn't really anything beyond that. It was kind of agreement that, right, in certain times we're not going to fight because, hey, both sides need to rest. You know, there was kind of that stuff too. Um, this, again, just happened more so much earlier on in the war. You don't see it as much as the fighting gets bloody later yeah. on. And also, you mentioned something before, uh, I think I clicked record when we briefly talked about this. The French were not all excited about this whole truce thing, because at the end of the day, it yeah. is in their country, like two thirds of it is taken over by the Germans. So they're not going to go and sing Christmas carols with the Germans. This this truce that that we're talking about, this particular one, they mostly happen between the British and the Germans. You know, the British are just in France helping the French. As far as the French are concerned, they're like, yeah, we're not going to. We don't want a truce. We want these people out of our country. Yeah, you definitely didn't see it that much with the Russians either, the Germans and the Russians. That's really, if you really like do like more of a research into this, you're going to see that it was basically a, a more about nationalities, right? There was deep distrust between the Germans and the French. There was almost no fraternization between those sides. They're not having those little truces, so you don't really have the Christmas truce between them, right? Yep. German and not um, the animosity they had with the Russians, that was even worse. So just, you know. Again, that's a whole other podcast. You want to talk about the Germans and the Russians, especially look at World War II, right? Yeah. Um, but the British, you know, a lot of them, Germany didn't invade Britain. Um, a lot of German soldiers lived in Britain. They spoke the language. I saw that, yep. So circumstances kind of found them on opposite sides in this conflict, but the differences were actually minimal. So they were kind of more open to this fraternization than some of the other sides. And that's and that's kind of what happens as when, when yeah. we get to it. And I, I think it's it was you brought something really cool up that idea that of course, I, I, did. of course you did I wasn't aware of the fact that based on this research that so many Germans had worked in Britain um, ten turn of the century I mean a lot of them worked in the restaurants a lot of them the British restaurants or British factories so and they were kind of forced to go back to fight with Germany and for Germany but most you know while it was very difficult to find a British soldier that spoke German a lot of German soldiers spoke English which made this event that we're talking about easier to happen at the time but this famous christmas truce on december 24th 
was obviously unofficial. Um, many officers disapproved of this, highly disapproved. Yeah. Headquarters on both sides, right, were extremely upset about this. And they said this should never happen again, and technically it doesn't. Um, but so let's let's get into it. So so what happens here? Well, basically, as it, it approached, like we talked about, um, it was clear to me the social war was not going to end soon. If you remember about World War One, both sides thought we're going to be home by Christmas, right? Yeah, that, that was, was kind of thing. like the saying. Now it's like, no, that's not really happening. So a lot of the frontline troops were disillusioned, right? The horrors of war that they're seeing. There was a lot of fighting. They were homesick because they were promised this um, short war. And what basically happens is that, well, there's a lot of different reports, but there was no official truce called, but it did occur on parts of the Western Front between the German and British units. Um, when you started hearing like uh, both sides kind of singing songs, I think it was a German started singing a song first. That's what it was. It yeah, 8.30 p.m. It was, p. Holy, yep. it was even Holy Night or Oh Christmas. Like It probably was um, Holy Night. I heard, right? Yeah, I heard Holy Night, Silent Night. Yeah. Yep. Silent Night. Yeah, that's what it was first. And then they hear that and then some of the British start singing also, the English version. And then supposedly yep. a German soldier comes out walking in no man's land, holding a white flag, and he's walking over. And then some of the British go out, and then it kind of goes from there. They have this kind of unofficial truce. They sing songs, they exchange gifts, food, cigarettes, stories. Um, yep. Some even compete in you know soccer games, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's kind of like what happens, and it, it kind of spreads. The reason why it's called the Christmas truce is because it was it was, it was actually a lot of this going down the across down the whole western line, yeah. front. So it wasn't just just like a small section, which a lot of times you would see this smaller fraternization, right, where they were coming allowed for the troops. This was pretty much across most of the line where it was British and in um, Germans. That's mostly where you yep. saw. Yep. Um, and it was a big deal because it was like it basically was a symbol of peace on earth, goodwill towards man in a battlefield, which is like crazy. Like if you can stop fighting for right now, why are you fighting at all? That's kind of like yeah. the mindset, you know? And just kind of like give people some perception to this. The Western Front trench system ran like 475 miles. It was huge. Yeah. So this, this didn't happen a, a, yeah. along the whole thing. No, it, but it yeah. happened in a lot of places along the, um, you know, the trench line. History is the greatest adventure story. But does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast. And the answer is that some women were seizing power, or escaping slavery, or spying for their country, or creating artistic masterpieces, while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married, and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And, you know, kind of what you were where you were bringing up this idea of a lot of people also put up little Christmas trees. I say start singing. Yeah. The Germans start singing. There's actually a famous picture kind of with that, right? Yep. Yeah, there was. Um, but a lot of as, as these Germans are singing, the British start singing the same songs because the music is the same almost, obviously. They're just in different languages. So they almost started singing together. And then someone put out a little Christmas tree like above. like They basically stuck their hand out and put the Christmas tree above the trench line. And they're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then from that point forward, that's when the other guy's like, I'm just going to do this. And he like just got out there with this white flag. And yeah, but this was kind of a ballsy move because, I mean, for all you know, this guy could have been easily shot. Right. Oh, they were taking a risk. I mean, they could have easily poked their head out and started walking. Then the other side just shoots them, and then it's going to erupt into a battle, right? And he did. We and there's a lot of like soldiers who write about this. You know, they talk about this. You know, we so we um, in their journals and so that their letters, you know, of officers you fearing treachery or the men to be yeah. silent. But up and down our line, we heard the men answering the Christmas greetings from the enemy. How could we resist each other? A Merry Christmas. Even though we yeah. might be at each other's throats immediately afterwards, right? This is from a yeah. uh, private Frederick Heath. He's a British soldier. So they, have, they kind of knew, like, listen, we know tomorrow we're going to fight them. But today, today we can be cordial. We can yeah, be friendly. Not? Yeah, why not? Which is, again, it kind of surreal. The but more again, you think it about it, it, it is surreal, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and but these guys were killing each other the, the day, the morning of. So it's not like this is, this is before fighting started. No, the fighting started. They literally paused it on Christmas Eve at like 8.30 p.m. Through the night, they kind of hung out. And this is where it gets into, well, what did they actually do? And there's so many different stories. And we, we know for a fact that there was soccer games being played because soccer was already played professionally um, through yeah. like, from like mid-1800s in England and like 1890s in Germany. 
so we know they played soccer. There's actually a pictures of a soccer. Yeah, that game was between the, the Saxons and the Scots, right? Exactly. So we know that you had, well, they said the Saxon because they were more friendly, right? Yeah, but yeah. The, we know that British played soccer. We know that Germans played soccer. But to this day, they're trying to figure out if it's true that Germans played soccer against the British. And some people say, yes, they did. Some letters allude to that. Others are kind of like, no, we played soccer, but no one says that they played, you know, across. And even if they did, there's no way they could have a full game. I mean, this was nighttime. Um, you know, trench, if, if they're playing in no man's land, I mean. Well, they yeah. said they set, they set up flares to kind of illuminate the night. I did see that. that. Was, yeah, that was in that some was letters. Kind of, that was yeah. in some of the letters and stuff like that. So there's a lot of sources here. Um they know well, apparently the Germans even though happened over 100 years ago. Yeah, the Germans won three to two. I did see yeah. multiple sources also the Germans won the game. The Germans won the game, so I they won something well. in their in their in their World War um, escapades. Right. But at least they won something, I guess. <laughs> You're Good for so them. Mean. You're I'm not so mean. mean. I'm historical. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they won something. <laughs> I, they won something. It would be good for them, you know. Uh, anyway, rather have um, the Germans of the First World War win something, not the ones of the Second. So it says that roughly 100,000 <laughs> British and German troops were involved in this informal hostility, you know, Christmas truce. I mean, that's like a lot if you think about it. So it really did have to happen along that line for more than more than one place for this estimate to exist. And this is, you know, from a fairly credible source. Yeah. Also, they said the artillery fell silent and basically it was like, all right, we're just going to we're just going to chill. Uh, until obviously officers got extremely got upset. In, in the end, and they, got, they put an end to it pretty quick. Yep. One guy that was in the German line actually wrote about it later in his journal. He was like, this is unbelievable. This is a, a travesty. And that guy's name is Adolf Hitler. Um, Cause he was yeah, there. there people that were happened. upset about it. And they were, I read some other ones that there were a couple of people that like, even though they weren't fighting, they were still like trying to see like, all right, how many guys do they have here? Where are there, you know, machine guns, you know, to try and get some information because they knew, listen, we, we're going to be buddy, buddy with this guy for the next hour, couple hours, but tomorrow we're going to be fighting them again. Like they yeah. knew this wasn't going to suddenly, the war wasn't suddenly going to end. Um, and the, actually the commanders don't want that. And the main reason is because then what you're doing is you're humanizing the enemy, right? Yep. You're putting like a, a face on this monster that, that you were told this, what the other side is. And that might cause a hesitation now when you're going to shoot, when you're going to shoot later on. You know, that might cause that moment's hesitation and that could be, a you know, something that changes the course of the battle. So they, they don't want – that's – for all war, you don't want – you don't want – you do not want to humanize the enemy. You do yeah. not want to see them as – have sympathy or have feelings, caring, anything, anything like that for the enemy whatsoever. And that's a, that's a great point because that's yep. kind of where the press gets into play because yeah. this, what yeah, we're the, talking the about – about later on, yeah. Yeah, but what we're talking about is the press eventually is kind of forced to respond to some of these rumors – because and they had to the press eventually starts reprinting government notices that any form of fraternization with the enemies constituted treason. You know, so the press is kind of trying to fix that because ultimately what happens is if you look at this this press after this, the events, you only have English newspapers that are like, Yeah, look at that, like, you know, malice towards none, uh, this is you know, Christmas above everything else and the british papers print a lot of the pictures and they print this story initially it is also printed in new york times um new york times says it's a great thing yeah Yeah. but coverage in germany is muted like no first of all they they, because they see this fraternization as treason so no german newspapers mention this at all and quite frankly none of the french ones mention this as at all as well so you're really just getting this from the british sector and through American newspapers, which is which is what further embarrasses England, and that's kind of where it was. It's the British in the years, the upcoming years, because we'll get to that a little bit. I guess we can get to it now. But these later truces, um, oftentimes the following year and the year after, the Germans try to institute and start those as well. Yeah, and, and the, the British, British are like, said no. Yeah, the British are like, no, that's not going to happen. Well, what because changes is, is an embarrassment. Is- yeah, as the war gets a lot more intense, especially in 1915, and then they said when both sides start using um, poison gas. I used tear gas before this, but when yeah. sides are using poison gas, it's kind of hard to go back and be like, oh, let's have, let's have a truce now. Yeah, you know, after after doing things like that. Kind so it, it basically, yeah, as as the war got more as to what we know as World War One is, um, the casualties increase and the bloodshed increases and all everything like that and the lifestyle. 
they're not in any mood to fraternize with them. And Christmas Day and Christmas Eve just became another day. Maybe they get like a little bit more uh, food or something like that from in the trench itself. But the trenches were not fun. They never were fun, but you're not having this sort of like reprieve anymore. Occasionally, the only reprieve you would have is they would still have that allowance. Right after the battle, go collect your dead. Yeah, basically just to, just to, just to clear off no man's land to get ready for next battle. That was really what they were doing. Those are the only other yeah. So following this, um, those are the and though even those were very occasional. They know what's happening. Like, yeah, they very occasional. Happen. Live and live, uh, at let live the th- approach. You know, it's like all right, let's pause for a bit, but no more Mister Nice Guy after 1914. In 1915, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, and if you saw that, had somewhat of a truce with the Ottoman Empire at Gallipoli. It happened in May. It was about collecting and exchanging. Um, yeah, it's dead. something that happens in war. Um, yeah. You do have this, right? That's what the Tet Offensive was supposed to be, um, right? Usually, it was like a not fighting, and then you know we get into that. We got into that in our 1968 podcast, but it's a common it's a common practice in war that live to let live, but not so much these truces. And then why this one caught on was like you said, a lot of the media caught on to it. The fact that it was Christmas, right? Yeah. And it really and a lot of modern tellings of the tale really give it that characterization, right? That it's like this heartwarming situation like you know look what can happen you know if you know if people just are you know humanitarians and they yeah, reject like war rom- romanticized sort of you know. yeah you know like what what it could have been if you know men just follow their hearts and stuff like that like and it's like yeah we're always stop fighting for one day and you always that always goes about one saying right like if those people who um declare war fought in the wars there'd be no war right yeah. these men these soldiers were really you know thrust into this they weren't the ones that decided to go to war yeah, they're fighting this war and they were kind of wondering with each other. They write in the letters. You see this like, you know, why are we fighting this war right now? There was one where the British were saying, you're Saxon, we're Anglo-Saxon. Why are we fighting? Yep. You know, and they were just like, yeah, why, what's going on with this? And then I think when a lot of the officers hear this, they're like, oh, this is not good. You know what I mean? We don't want this, you know, this spread across the lines anymore. And they put an end to it. Because if it, were, if it happened every year, eventually it's going to, especially when the war gets really bad, it could have been a point like, why are we even doing this at all? You know? Yeah, you don't want that. You don't want to fight nice with the enemy. There's some people that were very much against it, but there's a story of one guy that was just kind of everyone's out and supposedly talking and playing. It's dark out, and you have these flares above, and this guy's kind of sitting there, and a, and a German sniper shot and killed him, basically shot him in the head. Um, and this guy apparently was sitting next to a Christmas tree that had some ornaments on it. Again, just taken out, you know, into no man's land. So he gets shot in the head by a German sniper, and then all of the ornaments are shot off the tree to further that. Like some people were just, you know, not buying into this. It's sort of almost make like an interesting, you know, mystery book, you know, like within the truce, there's like a lone sniper, but it kind of was, I mean, it definitely happened. Yeah. There's a right? couple of those two that I saw too. That wasn't the only one that happened. There was a couple other ones where, you know, it's war. Yeah. So they were taking, they were definitely, they were definitely taking a chance with the other side with their, commanders with their fellow you know so fellow soldiers what was so no so like no political significance just you know just something that's very much romanticized uh you have a christmas truce memorial today um in france it was unveiled in 2008 apparently in the very spot where, where this happened and then i saw this one there's like an annual reenactment in rockford illinois yeah, illinois does it yeah yeah but why why did they reenact the christmas truce between the British and the Germans in Rockford, Illinois. I think what I there mean, was is there was a couple um, actual descendants from both sides, German and British, that actually lived in that area. So they just oh, decided okay. to put it together. Well, but, that's um, cool. Yeah. Because yeah. I was kind of curious, like, where, how did, what? Like, how does that come about? Um, Midway Village in Rockford, Illinois. It happens. Yeah, Midway Village. Apparently, it happens every year. Like, this is a thing. There you go. It's a, there you go for a little Christmas vacation there, Pete. Right. It, you know, we... We both said to ourselves, we're going right, to go research this. And we both came together before we click record and we're like, all right, this was not as big of a deal as even we thought it was. You know what I mean? Well, right? I mean, it's, it's, it is an interesting story. Yeah. Yes. Does it have significance on the war? No. Not really. It's kind of like looking in hindsight of what the war becomes. The fact that, it, that this happened during the war. And again, is this, even though it happened all the time to a certain extent, but it's not on the scale, I guess. And it, was, it wasn't everywhere. A lot of people say, oh, the entire war stopped. No, they were still fighting. But it is very significant. That, like, if, okay, it's how I always tell my students, if you could stop fighting for one day, what's yes. in fighting? And it fraternized with the enemy. It's not like they just stopped fighting. They actually were like buddy, buddy with the enemy for the most part. 
what's the point of this war happening anyway? Well, um, I guess that kind of brings us to the end of our short little podcast. See, it was short. Yay. To everyone that does tune in, thank you so much, guys. We really do appreciate it. If you ever need to reach us, you could reach us at www.historyteacherstalkingpodcast.com. Uh, we are there if you need us. And if you are listening to this, please feel free to leave us a review wherever it is that you listen to this podcast. We, we do greatly appreciate those. And I guess that's it, right? So see you guys next week. Enjoy. Stay safe, everybody. I hope everyone enjoyed our podcast. And if you would like to email us, you can do so at historyteacherspodcast at gmail.com. Around 10,000 BCE, families and tribes of the ancestors to the people of Britain would arrive in the southern part of the island after crossing from land that bridged from Europe. The Welsh built houses, communities, kingdoms, and continued to survive through Romans, Saxons, Danes, and Normans. The language and culture influenced by these sources continued to change and thrive, becoming ancient and modern at the same time. Join me as we travel through the history, meeting the kings, queens, nobles, and everyday people that create and grew modern Wales from the seeds of the ancient past. Creoso, and welcome to the Welsh History Podcast.